Hey, Judy. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. Well, let me grab my teacup. I'll do better in a minute. Cool. <clears throat> How is it in Portland today? Um, it's been like rainy, foggy, kind of hockey all <clears throat> last couple of days and in the foreseeable future. So we have, we have arrived at rainy Portland. Is this a portion of your normal season? Cause it's pretty uh, rainy up there. Yeah, pretty much. It gets rainy. And then, and then what happens is there's a period where it's rainy, but, but not awful. It's just like it rains and it clears up. It rains and it clears up. It rains and it clears up. So we're kind of there. So my forecast is for two days of sunshine in the next oops, two days of sunshine in the next week or nine days. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, how do you all? Hey, everybody. How are some of my favorite people doing? Jerry's in the matrix, you know, I don't know where everybody else is. What's that logo? Is that think that's the Kiko Labs logo, Charles? It is, indeed. Nice. All it's right, covered. so you're, at, you're in the lab, that's great. Oh, we're totally in the lab. Yeah, <laughs> lots of uh, bubbling test tubes and Petri dishes and yeah. Nice, nice. Um, yeah, so let's get, let's get ourselves organized. Okay. What? A, what where do we want to start? Just want to see who's here. Okay, good morning. Yeah, oh, hey. Good morning, Lauren. I guess it's good evening where you are, but. <laughs> it's afternoon, it's four. Okay. Quite a manageable time. When does evening, um, when does evening start? Is four o'clock the beginning of evening? <clears throat> well, now it's getting dark, five, 5.30-ish, so it's kind of shifted a bit. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to say, Pete, I'm excited about the CSC, Collective Sense Commons, and I, I feel like that's really relevant here. So I just want to state that in a broad way. Thanks. I'm, I'm resonating. <laughs> and I'm probably late on that, Pete. What's that, what's that all about? Uh, CSC is Collective Sense Commons, uh, and the idea is that um, I feel like there's, uh, the idea is kind of a communications and information commons for um, for organizations like OGM or Kikolab um, that are involved in collective sense making. So um, I'm, I, I've set up and then torn down and we'll set up again uh, and, and actually get it out. Uh, a Mattermost server, which is like Slack, but open source, and a media wiki, kind of for everybody to use together is the idea. Nice. Some of that stuff, I don't know what it means, but that's fine. Um, I think that's, that's part of the joy here. <laughs> All right, do you, um, Jerry, do you know if we're expecting anybody else? I don't remember or know who was on, uh... Hank's uh, invite list because the people are, who are on this call had asked to participate in the organizing structuring part. Of I think it was so. Hank and Hamilton, maybe. And not yeah, and I know both of them are in a in a session today, so um, um, I think Hank might be able to join in thirty minutes. But um, I know Hamilton is out. Um, he right. has sold his soul to one of our clients for the for the time being, um, which I I guess is okay because they're. They're paying for me to be here, so um, that's a good thing. Um, Very good. So um, yeah, I think again, just in terms of getting organized, and I, I point to the, the CSC, but also just in general repositories and and various channels and platforms and forums, and and kind of getting a more of a sense of coherence and, and accessibility and discoverability within all that. Yeah, and you know. Um, I think that's I think that's right. And the last conversation on Thursday, and maybe you know, part of being organized is also 
you know, naming what we're, what we're trying to organize, right? Um, and there's a couple of things that, and I'd love to just test this with you guys, that, um, and, and I had to jump off, so I don't know where you guys ended the Thursday, you know, Thursday call. But, um, you know, there's this notion of potentially that we have teams of people that are working on various projects or quests out in the, out in the world, right? Um, I think, um, you know, Claus, this is like the perfect example here is, uh, you know, the effort that you're, you know, that you're pursuing in terms of um, soil health and um, the food system and those sorts of things. That's a, that's a intervention point that you believe is important that OGM and what OGM can be could potentially be a, a, a resource to that intervention point, whether it's providing you know, any number of things, but that's, but it, but a quest is like an intervention into, into kind of the world as it exists today. And then we have, you know, um, you know, maybe Peter, we can define kind of this collective sense commons, you know, that's something that you're building in the lab, right? If you will, right? It's in the, it's in the laboratory, um, and this collective sense commons as a as a as a thing that you're building um, is something that um, could be used on any number of quests, right? And as quests are happening, and they realize that they need X, Y, and Z from something like, you know, CSC, you know, they're communicating with that lab to. Uh, and the lab is updating, updating that kind of that shared, you know, the shared tools and infrastructure. And I want to make sure that the lab, as we talk about it, is not only kind of um, technical software, you know, hardware systems, those sorts of things, but it also could be um, human software, right? And I think this is where we can you know, the lab could say, here are the methodologies we use to think about and create needs could be something that we do, right? Because the ability to create memes could be used on any number of quests. So labs are for things that can be leveraged into generically into quests, right? Um, is kind of the way there. And then, you know, Charles, to connect to what you were talking about and what I think this group ultimately about is, is to establish the nervous system, right? The way in which quests and labs and members of the OGM community or, or the network of OGM can um, uh, have interoperability, right? Because I think the nervous system is all about the interoperability of the pieces and ensuring, and ensuring sort of a you know, that interoperability. And then interoperability is everything from some sort of governance to uh, talking about business models, to talking about, um, you know, the system of ethics that um, I know that, um, you know, Neil is on or this manifesto or, you know, charter. So I think, I think there's that piece. So you kind of have, you know, and I, and I skipped over one of them, or I kind of alluded to one of them, which is the network itself, right? And the network could be made up of members, you know, like we're members, partners, people that are, you know, we know we have an active relationship with, such as Kiko Lab could be a partner, Collective Next could be a partner, even though Matt is a member and Lauren, you're a member kind of thing. And then neighboring communities, right? Neighboring communities are other other communities that, um, while they may not be directly involved in the stewardship or the promotion of OGM, there are people that we want to be connected to. So you have quests, you have labs, you have our network, and then those things are held together by a nervous system that we have to design and implement. And that nervous system has a lot of pieces. So let me pause. Does that mental architecture give us some shape? Am I missing something? How do you, how are you guys thinking about it? So let me, let me step back. 
And I think we don't have to race, uh, Pete. We can. I mean, I'll, I'll acknowledge you. I, I, what I don't want to do is play facilitator, right? Um, I think um, we also have to think about our operating stuff. But yes, please. Um, I, uh, I, I like the general architecture. I, I, um, I think I maybe call things differently and think of things a little bit differently. And so okay. maybe, maybe a place to start is thinking about when the OGM network um, uh, has uh, 5,000 people in it, um, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. Yep. Um, uh, where you see quests, I, I actually see pretty much organizations. Actually, an organization is going to be doing a quest. So for me, CSC feels like a, an, an organization, a sister organization to OGM and to Kika Lab. And, and all the members are intermembers of each other, probably. Um, and you know there would be members of OGM who aren't members of Kika Lab, members of OGM who aren't members of CSC members of CSC who aren't members of OGM. Um, can, I, can I just quickly interject? Just because in, in regard to the word members, and I just was looking at this in some new work that, that Lauren and I are putting together, and that could have different meanings. I just want to say it could be form, relatively formal or relatively not so formal. So please go ahead. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think so the... Um, uh, for me, it, it's interesting that you make a distinction between quests and labs. Um, I, I'm not sure what I think about that, but I've been thinking of CSC as a, a project or a quest, essentially. Um, there, there does seem to be, there, there, there's certainly a difference. So projects and quests, um, I've been talking with other people. Those are like action groups. Mm -hmm. um, and then technology groups are doing IT or, or human facilitation. When I say technology, I'm you know, completely happy to include human process as a technology. Um, and IT is its poor step sibling, which gets all the credit, but none of the joy. Um, uh, but so action quests or action projects and infrastructure quests or projects. Um, for better or for worse, the way OGM, the organization has, has, has been moving itself, it feels like an infrastructure project to me where uh, we've been super good at, at connecting organizations, connecting people and things like that. Um, and as yet, we're not super good at, at an action, being an action network. And I think that's fine. I'm, I'm not saying anything is good or bad, right? Um, uh, but I would love to see a, a quest or an action project around soil regeneration. Um, and I feel like that's better for everybody if that's not an, I mean, that you know, soil regeneration project, the quest, should be an OGM member, and there should be lots of cross fertilization. But I think it's actually better if it's outside the um, outside, you know, calling it an OGM quest. I think it's within the federation of. So then I go into federation, and all these things are federated, right? So right. a thousand people federated in loosely federated in groups of you know twenty fifty something like that. Um, I think. When I think of OGM, I, I, the other things I've said about OGM is it's a protocol, it's a verb, it's right. you know our gift to the world. Here's how you work together. Here's how you federate. Here are the things that, you, that federation means. You know, we kind of have this loose definition of of membership. Um, so OGM has a fuzzy you know definition of membership. Kiko Lab does, CSC does, but you're also when I think of collective sense commons, I want the people in it, or actually OGM and OGM marketplace. Um, uh, you you kind of need to be a member. Um, so signing up to be a member has some loose things. You know, I'm I'm responsible to the group. I I affirm that I've I'm of good intent. I'm willing to listen to other people. Um, I'm willing to change my, my mind. Those kinds of things kind of define membership, right? And if you can't do that about the OGM ideals or the CSC ideals or the soil regeneration ideals, maybe you're a friend, but you're not a member, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would just so, add, this is great. This is really right on time to, to what we've been talking about. 
also in the, in the session yesterday. Um, but just to add to the, the piece about engagement. So I think you're right. And we, we Lauren and I, again, came to this point about commitment, responsibility, and de defining those things. Um, but also in this kind of liminal time of onboarding and, and just getting attention, you know, and hoping, you know, trying for engagement, then the engagement itself actually puts a, um, another kind of definition or, or detail um, as to the type of membership. So just to say that, the engagement. Help, help me understand what you, Charles, what, when you say, like, give me a specific there, because I think I understand what you're saying. I just want to make sure we're using the Okay, same. well, we couldn't certainly go into that. If you want to hear a little bit, we, we went into it quite a bit last night, and this is in general, like uh, relating to our knowledge repository and the kind of uh, roles and tasks involved in just growing that knowledge garden and, and keeping it up. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of kind of busy work in a sense, grunt work that uh, is detail oriented um, and, and involves exactly, you know, making the recordings, the transcripts, highlighting, editing, mapping, um, all that stuff for the knowledge repository. That's mm -hmm. prim primarily, there's more, but yeah. Can I rephrase that? Or just getting really super specific about what roles we think we need in Kiko Lab Network and um, who uh, like basically put bounties on them and put very, very specific about the design considerations and what we decided is that we're going to design, we're going to come out with a currency or point system. It's just basically a simple bounty system with points attached to each, um, to roles we decide are important. And uh, we're designing this around innovation diffusion and kind of um, encouraging each other to try each other's stuff. So um, it's basically encouraging people to um, try things. So it's like uh, giving incentive to the kind of like the, the first followers So we're designing we're designing like a process to take people through who have um, big visions but don't know exactly how to go about actually accomplishing them because they don't have you know for a lot of these things you need you know business you need to be like a, an expert in business flow and a designer and a charismatic speaker and a presenter and just you know very few people are that. So we're gonna to try to take that expertise in, in our network and try to get people to be able to present their ideas much more clearly and get plans that are clear and um, basically have testable prototypes way earlier than they think they should uh, via uh, Pete's suggestion and, and Judy's. So yeah, and, and I also wanna say just OGM I think is doing a great job uh, connecting people because, you know, I know we um, we wouldn't be where we are right now without uh, OGM and, you know, just getting to know like amazing people through through the call. So I think it's working. Um, two brief things and then I'll pass it to Judy real quick. Uh, one is that I think we're envisioning quests as being temporary. Like a quest is like a bad analogy, crusade. That that the quest is is out to try to achieve something, and once it's achieved, then its work has turned into new assets, has turned into new organizations and relationships, other kinds of things. But but questing uh, should feel like a mission, uh, not in the sense of the organization's mission, but rather being on a mission together, being on a quest together. Uh, so that there's a sense of, oh, we're aiming to, to complete this thing over here, and then that particular quest might be done. Um, and then also that other pieces, uh, I'm, I'm sort of seeing them as kind of free-floating our uh, DNA, some of which gets absorbed into uh, OGM and, and becomes uh, the mitochondria, for example. So, so mitochondria, the little uh, energy engines in, in our cells, they used to be like external bacteria and we assimilated them symbiotically. They just climbed on board and became a part of human cells. That's how human cells make energy for muscles and for thinking for everything else. And so I see, I see sort of snippets of code and process and method as being free floating DNA that we're just like that we would like to use and do and we absorb it and it becomes central to 
our infrastructure, our nervous system. I'm not sure exactly what, you know, what part of that uh, language to use there. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of partner organizations. We hope, I mean, the, the quest into food system, uh, regenerative ag, soil fertility could involve, uh, if we're really lucky, um, hundreds of partners because a piece of what I think OGM would be good at doing is bringing together, convening, connecting, gluing together uh, a bunch of things so that a lot of disparate efforts can remain with their disparate identities, don't get homogenized, but rather are starting to work together in sync and are starting to connect up to cause a larger shift uh, of consciousness, which I think, I think OGM is, is in some measure uh, out to change how humans see the world and one another so that they'll make more positive change in the world, uh, which would include uh, being able to talk to people who are really different from us or have like seemingly impenetrable ideas, which is a, an interesting feeling these days. Yesterday, having read a bunch of reports from nurses in ERs reporting that uh, there are people dying of COVID who will not in any way admit that they've got COVID, that it, that it even exists, which is like, that, that feels like an impenetrable reality barrier. Uh, but I think that's a piece of OGM's mission is how do we, how do we dissolve even things like that? So, Judy. Well, this is, this is the epitome of snarky. Um, <laughs> because I think we're, what, what it seems to me is we're talking on many different levels. And it might be helpful to identify levels and then subsets of levels just in a conceptual framework, because I think I'm starting to draw lots of arrows and stuff between all the different connecting things on the notes I'm taking. <laughs> and there are common themes that I think are the overarching ones, but then there's, they split very rapidly into subsets within those themes. And I guess I, saw, I see OGM in the simplest possible way as the big umbrella is a collection of connections of a lot of different types. And then I would suggest that we consider how those connections work as entities differently than how they work as processes. Because I think there's going to be an array of processes avail available to a group and different groups that will want to connect with each other who will need to merge processes. <laughs> and so I sort of see it as a human toolbox in terms of intellectual assets and connective assets and knowledge content that all operates sort of on a needs-based way. So I can imagine a small community saying, we need to set up a food shelf. How can we do that the most effective way? And the kind of processes they will need is different than what the UN would need for a global issue. And we're gonna have everything in between. And part of our complexity right now is where do we wanna start? Because that's gonna determine how we evolve to a certain extent but there'll be a lot of intervention and branching points. And briefly before handing to Klaus, part of the reason we could be useful to a food bank and to the UN is that I think our approach is pretty meta. It's like, how do we collect up when ways, ways of conquering all these different issues, whether it's bridging the cultural divide or uh, alloc allocating food equitably in a neighborhood or addressing you know, different kinds of things. And, and as we remain meta, we get useful to everybody um, rather than suddenly having too many relationships to manage. I think, I think the key here is to not try to be everything for everyone and suddenly be hold, you know, juggling 4,000 balls, but rather to be useful to everyone uh, such that they can come in, feed at the trough, get exactly what they need, go find connections, go find people, uh, and go change the world for the better some more. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this <clears throat> connective tissue. What, what, what comes to mind is the, is the spiral dynamics uh, approach where they're talking about a V meme. Right? So there's a, a small V attached to a large meme. And in a, in a sense that that V functions like the rudder on a ship. 
you know, it, uh, it provides direction, it steers. So that's a value uh, proposition. When you think about the food system, for example, um, that value proposition would be you know, soil health, or the restoration of the ecology, which really begins uh, with soil. Um, and then out of that, we can spin um, particular memes that, that function at different levels. Uh, like uh, it could be in a community food system or it could be the United Nations uh, uh, the declaration of uh, larger, larger events. Um, and then my, what, what, I, what I perceive as um, an, an opportunity in the market uh, in, in terms of uh, information to, to, to provide uh, the market with you know, support and material, there, there are an endless array of support systems in place already. Uh, many of them operating on a national level who are not necessarily connected. I mean, first of all, they operate independent of one another um, and they don't, they, don't, they don't act in concert uh, when they come to a specific community. Um, and then many of them are specialized for specific types of community. Now you may have, uh, for example, a black community, you may have a rural community, inner city community and so on. Um, and we, and, and I actually saw that uh, it, it slipped by yesterday um, where one group was talking about taking community level assessments. You know, so, so you, you assess a, a, a given community based on the resources they already have available, but they may be disconnected and the individual uh, uh, resources they have could be connected to a national infrastructure. I'm sorry, my phone just goes up. Um, and and, uh, uh, and so, so you, you could look at this like in like a, in March, like a modular format where you can, we, we can interact with one community and then say, assess that here are resources that could be available to you. To act like a broker in this in this sense, I think that could be within the range of our capacity also. I think you know, Klaus. The piece that I um, I hear what you're saying, and I'm like, yes. And then I think at a kind of try to push to that more meta level and. Um, there's so many of these things that are kind of um, tracks of um, opportunity. And this group has um, a wide variety and difference of opinion of what is the right answer, to, what is the right thing to invest in, right? And I'm wondering if the, if where, where we were going, you know, Pete, what you were saying about how do you federate? How do we federate at a global scale, right? How do we create a collection of open connections that can be applied to, and it's almost like, um, you know, the anarchist playbook where, you know, Klaus, you're gonna say, hey, this is what I wanna, this is the quest that I wanna go on, who's with me? And the net, you ping the network and the bigger the network is, the more opportunity and, and that verified that that network is, the more opportunity that you're gonna find people that are gonna say, yes, Klaus, I'm gonna work with you for the next whatever it is. And we're gonna start moving something. At the same time, you know, Lauren might say, this is what I wanna be working on. Or Neil says, this is what I wanna be working on. And it is in that collection of connections and, and Judy, I think that that's, you know, sort of right now what the beauty of OGM is. I think the part of the challenge is, I'm, I, I think we're all still having a little bit of a hard time accessing and coalescing movement around, you know, these things. I've got a lot of really great connections. My brain is opening. I'm thinking differently. But if I say, I need this project and I need to get it up, up off the ground, um, it, it, 
things can potentially break, you know, maybe break down. So I, I don't know how we stay open versus lock on picking one thing or, or, or another thing, right? I think that's what I meant by the different tiers within the conceptual structure, because in the sense of OGM as a knowledge content of facts, movements, people, processes as, as sort of an, a, a mega encyclopedic information connection device, that's gonna keep growing because all of the groups that participate, that there's gonna be backflow of knowledge and additional processes and content, another thing to make it very, very organic. So from one sense, I see the, the implementation is a different aspect of OGM and it would be worthy to talk about OGM as, an, as the collective knowledge content entity and the scope and type of collective knowledge. And the process part of it is not only the framework of processes, but the actual process of distribution of that knowledge and content, because yes. it's going to become a pull rather than a push very quickly. And that's what we would want, but we want the wisdom of that pull to come back into the larger knowledge whole so that it's an even better resource to the future groups that want to use it. Charles, then Neil. I just want to give a major props to Pete for um, in general kind of documenting and, and, and uh, harvesting links. And, and uh, one email recently in particular was a wonderful summary of what's happening in the discourse forum. And this is like incredibly valuable and awesome. And I think really speaks um, to, to the, the specific ways that, that we can know what's happening and, and just have the possibility of awareness and then to be able to connect and get involved and so forth. Um, and again, just, you know, fundamental, we all this talk about processes and, and connecting and collaborating and all this, it's kind of very lofty and abstract without the communication. Fundamentally, we need those channels clear, established and, um, flowing. Neil? Forgive me for dropping in late. Um, picking up a few yeah. keyword, picking up a few keywords here, flow, estuary, keeping channels flowing, um, you know, unraveling, and an analogy that came to me today with regard to another project. My father used to take me fishing in a very small boat. And because we didn't go often enough, part of my role was that after every third cast, when the line got tangled, I would be sitting behind him unraveling the tangled line while he kept his linear fishing line in the water to make sure that we didn't waste the time on the water to actually catch something. So the linear project flow is once you've got your bait on the hook or once you actually got a specific idea of what you're going to do, it's in the water. But somebody in the background is actually unraveling the line, recognizing the thread, keeping it flowing as Pete does here, right? holding the space for the next piece of bait or the next project. And there's multiple roles that are being played in this group. Part of it's the exploratory role. You know, when ants are, move, are looking for food, they zigzag. Once they've found it, it becomes a linear progression back to the, the most efficient and effective way to get the food back to the colony. And I know, Jerry, you've used the leaf cutter ants. You know, even once they get there, they then foster fungal growth rather than eat the plants themselves. So. To me, there's a common pool of resources which we are co-creating. There are stocks and flows of information, knowledge, wisdom, but there are different roles uh, in terms of who's holding the stock, who's holding the flow, who's holding the process, who's holding the project. And again, I think there's multiple horizontal levels at which we can get off if there's sufficient critical mass to go there. The group doesn't have to agree that we're all going to do this particular project. However, I think we do have a, a, an obligation to set a, lev a level of strategic ethical principles with which every project will be tested to see whether or not it is worth doing, All right? So yes, the group agrees this is a project worth doing. Now, when you find the resources to do that, you know, 
feel free. I mean, you can draw on and you can draw on the information we've got to do that whenever you like, but don't expect us all to jump onto your boat or your project. Thanks. Go ahead, Klaus. Then I'll, yeah. then I'll jump in. My boss had just went off. I'm baking bread, but it can sit for another minute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> life uh, goes on. Yeah, life goes on. Um, what 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 occurred to me? I mean, I retired in 2012, you know, from from my corporate life, and I tried to work as a consultant. And every contract I got was like Universal Studios, Beijing, and Motion Gate Dubai, and stuff like that. It was all theme park work, and I was like sick of it because I had really started focusing on food systems and I participated in a competition that was uh, uh, organized by Innoventions. It's an online group for the AARP and it was called the Elimination of Food Deserts. Now, I had no idea what a food desert was at the time. I never heard of it. And I had just come back from 10 years overseas working in Asia and in Europe. I was headquartered the last five years in Düsseldorf and working international in 30 countries, looking at, at, at as a uh, corporate head of target group marketing, looking at food systems. I would do operations audits, you know, uh, in in uh, Russia, in India, in Pakistan and stuff. And so I come back and I realize that this American food system is a complete fiasco. I mean, it's a disaster, right? Um, so I tried to engage from a consulting perspective and it was like zero interest. I mean, no one even wanted to talk about it until I started going into the NGO world now. And then, so I started working with a, a, a variety of NGOs and, and sort of worked my way up into you know, national uh, uh, core team positions with the Sierra Club, Citizen Climate Lobby, Business Climate Leaders now. Um, but what you realize is that the world, the, the part of society that needs the most help has absolutely zero resources focusing on it. So when, when, when I'm talking about these multiple support structures that are available, virtually all of them are focused on uh, low income uh, environments, uh, needy population groups and so on. And they have like zero skills. I mean, you're, you're dealing with, with, with a group of people who are highly motivated, they're wonderful people, they have no idea how to organize anything. You know, I mean, they're, they're really working uh, uh, very hands-on uh, uh, and, and oftentimes with very limited resources. So the, the but some of them uh, have developed a, a pretty decent platform I mean, when you think about W Food Park, for example, you know, there's one organization that focuses on um, uh, getting, getting a community to raise money, which is coming through a variety of sources from the hospital, insurance companies, banks, you know, the individual donors. And then anybody who, who is entitled to food stamps can go and, and cash in their voucher and get double the money for it. Uh, so you can go to the farmer's market and, and uh, you have $10 food stamps. Now you can buy $20 worth of product. That idea is well fleshed out. I mean, they're really making, have done a, a good job in explaining it. But there is really no push behind it you know, to roll that out nationwide to make communities aware of it who had no idea this is happening and then expand on the idea, you know, get, uh, make, bring local merchants into it, uh, bring CSAs into it, you know, uh, uh, advance the, the reach that this can take so that you have local money starting to spin in the local community into dedicated targets. So there, there are so many of these opportunities available, but it's in the low income sector. These are not people who have the capacity to pay consulting fees. So the money to do this will have to come from other sources, which are also readily available. And I need to take my bread out of the oven now. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so a couple things. I'm, I'm taking seriously Pete's suggestion that OGM is a verb and trying to play out what that means. And sort of a standard way of describing an organization would be, uh, here is who is in core staff and is on salary, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm starting to play out like, um, maybe what this means is we describe, we have a way of describing every entity that is in the, the estuary, 
kind of. Uh, and one of the dimensions of that description is how ogm -y is this, right? And if it's extremely ogm -y, it's like, this is fantastic, but we may not have any, any proximity to them or any, any connection to them. We may not have built a bridge to them or anything like that. So a second dimension is, might be, go ahead. Is it a verb or is it an adjective? Um, well, uh, it's or a now. verb, you, to OGM, OGM is a process, but it also becomes an adjective because yeah, okay. it becomes a measure or a quality or an intention that you can hold things up to. And the way we understand what the intention is, is by having these conversations, by sort of mixing this through, and then by reifying or, or, or creating models that let us explain our intention to one another, which is partly the intent of the pattern language that we're hoping to present to OGM because a pattern uh, language is a nice way of distilling how we do things more verby than, uh, than nouny. Um, and so for example- Now we need to come back to the, to the pattern language, but please go on. Yeah, exactly. So for example, thinking about OGMing as verb means that there's an entity out there called game B and the only proximity we have to it is that we have a couple members who've heard of it or might be members of game B, but we've not done anything to reach out. So. So uh, on ogm -y, it's like very ogm -y, but on how close are they, it's like they're still pretty far away. Some things that are floating around are so good and so ogm -y, and we've already built the bridge and absorbed them that they are an internal part of our DNA. So their, their closeness rating would be a 10 because they become a part of how we work. They become a part of how we do, you know, uh, how we approach the world. And then as we're harvesting all this stuff, we are busy curating um, best, the best things, basically a series of stories of positive action. Um, and my own amateur uh, theory of change is that one of the most powerful things you can do is tell stories about things that worked, um, let people appropriate those stories as they need help, offer them help in whatever way you can, whether that's software or experts or whatever other kinds of things. And that most of the problems we have in the world are not money problems. Uh, most of the problems we have in the world are not problems that will be solved by large amounts of money. And in fact, that large amounts of money are honeypots for people who know how to extract large amounts of money from uh, large system integration efforts. Uh, and they warp the intentions and, and sort of methods of the people that are nearby. Now, we do need flows of money so that the people involved in the system can make a living. So one of the dimensions of OGMing as a verb is how are, are we contributing to this person's sort of well-being uh, monetarily? And in, in some cases, it'll be on a quest or a project basis, and it'll be yes, yes, yes for now. And then they've stepped outside and they're sort of waiting to, to, to find another engagement or role or paid gig. Uh, in other cases, there'll be people who are busy building uh, sort of in the middle of it, who are constantly contributing to the, to the framing of OGM. And so they're, they're effectively on salary, I guess. Um, but uh, trying to figure out sort of how all those things play together. So off to you, Matt. I've got um, dogs howling in the background, so maybe they're um, they're participants in this process. I think you're under attack by vampires or werewolves. Yeah, they, they sound um, like right now. Anytime, anytime a um, an ambulance or a fire truck or anything with a siren goes by, my dogs are also add additive to that siren. So. They're really good sensors of um, when something's going on in the universe. Um, um, so I just want to use what Klaus said as a use case here, because I think I think this is a really um, interesting thing. Klaus proposed he he identified a, an intervention in the world, right? He said, "Look, there are these people." They have discovered these things, but they don't have this to really help them get it, get it, get it to the next level, right? So what you would want, I, what I think we would want from OGM is that, Klaus, I, there is not a time that I've heard you kind of talk to this group that you're not advocating for doing something in the space that you're passionate about. And I think hopefully you're feeling the rest of us say, yes, that's important stuff to do, which I think is one of the reasons why you continue to show up to this group is because we're validating the fact that you're on the right quest, right? right. You are on a quest right now. What, what I would like from OGM as a system mm -hmm. is that instead of you coming to this meeting and every meeting, 
hitting the wall saying, here, I'm on this quest, help me, help me, help me. And I know you came to us about, you know, doing some, you know, some graphic stuff and Scott was on that and I, you know, it never, we know, I, I know I didn't satisfy that need for you. Um, but what we would want is OGM to very quickly and effectively get you to the people that help you, that join you on this quest and can help get that thing up and running. Whatever the thing is that you name, because I trust you that you're sensing the world and identifying things that fit within the ethos, the system of ethics, which we haven't fully defined yet, but of OGM, which we've talked about defining, right? And so, so we need to find more people like you and we need to find more people that can help you. And that's part of this knowledge ecosystem is the knowledge of those, those individuals who are in a position and who have the skills to be able to, to support you on your quest. That's part of, that's part of, the, of the story. I think the other part of the story is that we have to design this system of ethics. We have to name it. We have to write it down. We've had many versions of that. I think you need to get that so that we can evaluate who we want to draw into this network, right? Um, in the right way. And I think drawing people into this network is a job to be done so that there are more and more resources that we're tapped into and can connect to. And then we need the infrastructure, you know, to to collect these connections. And the connections are to connections to ideas, connections to people, connections to resources, connections to technologies, connections to processes. But somebody has to, you know, we have to build that infrastructure. And that's what we don't have right now. So we're, so we're in a, you know, we're inefficient. And I think that's what the you know, maybe I don't, we shouldn't call it the, the lab, but I think that's the nervous system that isn't built yet. That I think if we spent time on an internal quest to getting that, then we would be more effective in addressing your external quest. So, and, and, uh, Pete, and Pete, yeah. I think, I think the, the notion between lab and nervous system is to try to figure out what do we call people who are, whose efforts are directly involved in building out some form of infrastructure that's going to be essential to OGM and, and its operations. So, so that's, I think that's the spirit of, of what Matt is referring to as a lab. Um, and I, that think that makes, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I, I would suggest actually, and, and I'm not saying this in opposition to lab, I think you, saying lab is, is very concrete and helps people. Um, now conceptually and with some of the stuff that we've done in Free Jerry's Brain actually, um, uh, for me it's meta and meta meta and meta meta meta, which yeah. I know sounds crazy, but um, Free Jerry's Brain is actually doing some meta 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 stuff, which is really helpful about pattern languages, about uh, federation, about, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, and then that ties into um, a, a a uh, really, really smart philosopher, Douglas Hofstetter, um, who says everything is, gets chunked. People make analogies and that's a recursive system that goes way up and way down. So as a, so as a meta meta thing, <laughs> I think we're talking about meta and chunking and analogies. From a, from a meta perspective, um, the, the I mean, talking about the, the food system here, the, what I'm on at this point and, and working with the Sierra Club and other groups to, to, to make them aware of this challenge is you have a movement in the farming community and in the agricultural community to get farmers to stop using you know, synthetic nitrogen and all these chemicals and, and shift their, their, their practices. You have consumers, I mean, sorry, consumers, you have the public, <laughs> You have, <laughs> you have the okay. public who, uh, um, who is becoming increasingly aware of the chemical contamination of their food, the nutrient deficiency in their food, the, the composition of foods that are actually damaging to their health. So there's that. And in the middle, you have a supply chain that has structured itself in a way that is not makes it impossible for them to to uh, uh, deal with a decentralizing agriculture, with an agriculture that, that wants to 
regionalize its production uh, using different seeds, different types of crops, different crop rotations, and so on and so on. So to, to make that system see itself and make the, the public aware of how their buying decisions and consumption patterns impact you know, the capacity of the farmer to change, that in itself is just information. You know? That in itself uh, uh, will, will already um, uh, influence the system. You now, and then to go in and provide um, uh, uh, tools, you know, at the community level, so that uh, the community members can now feel more empowered in influencing that food system because they may have spending, they may have uh, access, you know, so that's so what I sort of see as a meta structure. And, and just, just thinking about the quest you're on and my interest in the quest you're on and how OGM might help the quest you're on, my, I come back to what ways might we help the beneficial movement toward regenerative agriculture tip, which could be um, making a software platform for evaluating soil fertility and uh, getting food to market or whatever. Like it could be finding and connecting uh, those things to farmers, maybe. It could be making a better visualization and a uh, logical explanation of why this is better for the world available to more people by tweaking the delivery mechanism, by thinking through how it's explained, by enlisting children to sing it, by whatever. It could be, and this is, my, this is one of my amateur hunches, it could be figuring out a way, a way to approach your neighbors who own the fertilizer and the John Deere dealership in town and to say, hey, if you did this other thing for me, you could still make a living and it would be really helpful because the moment they shift to natural farming, they've made enemies in town from the industrial agricultural sector, which basically owns everything. These are the wealthier people in their town who they go to church with every day. So it also might mean creating a new religion or a church movement that's all about green evangelical something or other, because there is a green evangelical movement. And maybe, maybe, what, maybe what we need to do is help green evangelicals sprout, buy up AM radio stations, take over the airwaves from the conservatives, and get this meme so hot that everybody's like, I gotta do that. And, and, and that may not be on your radar, Klaus. It may be because Klaus, you're a really rational guy and, and I can see you saying, look, this is compelling. Why is, we just need to say this more and change it. I'm busy trying to figure out how do we hack people's sense, uh, people's sense of the world around them so that they start, so that their intentions shift so that they then suddenly start moving toward all the things you want them to do and I may, we may need to hack weird parts of the psyche to do that in really unusual ways. And sometimes the more unusual the way, the more it gets noticed, the more you get free media because it gets retold, the more it carries itself through meme propagation, which is what Kiko Lab is doing with memes. I mean, so, so, so I'm really interested in, and, and then once we see some of these that work, we then codify them into our pattern language and how we work and what we do in our little arsenal of tools so that anyone can go, go, oh, how did they succeed in getting everybody to shift to natural regenerative art, agriculture? Oh, they did these five things. And that's not and, exactly and, the same thing Jerry, we're doing here in mining, but we need to tweak it in these ways. Uh, and at the ahead, same Matt. time, Jerry, Kevin is doing, trying to do the same thing in you know, the financial system. So exactly. you know, if we say, look, there are these, we're creating movements in the major human systems. To create those movements, we need a whole bunch of quests from those quests, we will learn how to do things more effectively and to organize things. And then we need to build the infrastructure to enable that stuff. And some people need to really be focusing on infrastructure and some people need to be really focused on the, the process of creating those movements and questing itself. And I think that's the only delineation that I'm trying to make. And then we need our, we need our fricking, you know, uh, system of ethics, pattern language, you know, um, Magna Carta, whatever we want to call it, um, and and then and that's how we get after this. And I think right now we're try we're 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 competing with each other for which is the most important thing versus dividing into and subdividing and building enough resources to get the whole thing up and running. Neil and Charles, sorry. Love the passion, um, class. I've known you for quite a while, and. I've seen you change significantly in that time through the conversations on LinkedIn and your own personal quest and education. 
uh, and I also still see that you have a single quest and the only way was one of the arguments you and I used to have uh, eight years ago. Uh, the only way we're going to do this is there isn't only one way. There are multiple, multiple, multiple ways. What we're talking about here is how do we create the mutually assistive community that enables you on your quest because the model and the pattern language behind that mutually assistive community will be the same for Kevin's quest and your quest and other quests. This is where it taps into human complexity, each individual human, each individual's development uh, and capacity to hold systemic thinking and capacity to be educated and access to resources. The mutually assistive community that I tried to help start build about two years ago was around regenerative agriculture, but recognizing that way out there are people that are raising the consciousness of the collective for nothing who will never be resourced but in the absence of which there is no market for those people who are coming through behind them as the entrepreneurs and in the absence of a market there is no project to actually provide the money to do the work on the ground and so this is a three-dimensional if potentially four-dimensional process of human development collective human development alignment but within a broader meta pattern language within which multiple nested projects can be supported. And if we get the DNA for the meta process right, multiple other projects, depending on their priority, can rise or fall within it. So to me, the, the meta stuff here is how do we hold the space for your project and Kevin's project and everybody else's project and create the stuff which some people can't see, which is the meta consciousness raising, the systemic alignment to bring it into projects that can then be funded and systematized. But the first thing is the systemic and we're dealing with systemic fragmentation, you know, wicked problems equals com social complexity times fragmentation, right? And we've got multiple socially complex individuals, even in this group. So to get to that alignment is really tricky. There's more I could say, but I'll, I'll stop for now and I'll, I'll think about that next little bit. But that's my meta frame. My role in, in this in Europe at the moment is deliberately probing and being a disruption to people who think they're doing it. And they nearly spit me out every time. And at the same time, my own team doesn't want me to say these things because it jeopardizes their role in this project. If Neil's seen it to be part of us and he says this thing, it's going to challenge it. And yet when they see the stakeholders going, yeah, that's what we need, they go, how come we didn't get that? And so in that moment that I have to create where there's a question mark in people's minds and hearts that aligns closer with the realities that we need to move towards, which they feel but can't articulate, that's where the learning happens. Then they're looking for where are the resources to learn about, find out about, do something with. And that's where they come to OGM and others. But you need the probers that open up the space and you need the mechanisms for bringing it back together and some sort of mechanism for weaving and returning the efforts of that investment and engagement back to those who are doing it for nothing. And the commons based approach has the, the, the commons pool of producers and productive uh, product. It has an entrepreneurial coalition, which looks at how to monetize that in the old sense. And it has some sort of supportive body underneath that normally a not for profit, which holds the relationships in a way that enables the whole system to survive as a commons. And that's my sense of what OGM could do because it's got all of those skills in it already. Let me go to Charles, but then I'd like to go back to Klaus and just ask you Klaus to reflect on what I said and what Neil said and whether those things, whether what we said makes you happy, troubles you, feels like progress, doesn't feel like progress, just your, your own visceral feeling about what, what we've just put on the table, but first to Charles. Yeah. Hi, I'm um, going to try to do some more weaving. I've been um, <clears throat> shuffling these pieces around on my map as uh, kind of going with the flow of this, this thread in, in terms of the sequence. Um, but I see the weaving happening, uh, certainly network weaving, collaboratory weaving is something that, that we're very interested in in terms of interoperability, project and organization weaving, of course, and idea and solution weaving. So I just noting these different kind of weavings happening at different levels. Um, and then actually, I um, just to jump over to, to Klaus as one of the sort of use cases as Matt put it a, a bit today. And um, 
kind of within another f frame, Jerry, that you mentioned, I think in, not in one of the main calls, but the idea of convergence and divergence. And um, this came up in Kiko Lab a bit. And just in, in terms of like the, the real estate of the synchronous calls um, um, and then the, the other channels and, and communication places and forums in terms of attention spreading and um, energy and action over time. I don't know if that's making much sense, but this is what I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this kind of dance between the convergence and divergence and, and just choices within um, the, the ecosystem that, that's uh, before us with, with OGM. Um, pattern languages. So uh, here again, I think OGM and, and Kiko Lab are reaching toward making pattern languages, probably multiple ones. Um, the one that I'm um, kind of feeling most in the center um, of and with is, is the interoperability flow, which I think relates a lot to, to what we're talking about with, with Marc Antoine. Um, just to throw this in, also impact measurement, I don't know, we didn't really, I think that's, that's something, a kind of a big elephant in the room that, that relates on, on a lot of levels in terms of workflows, protocols, and so forth. And lastly, um, back to the network weaving, uh, it may not be um, a big leap to just connect with Michael Dowd, um, this uh, eco-evangelist that I haven't connected with directly, but he's, he's connected with Tom Atlee and this project around wise adaptation and um, a pattern language there. And I think it also points to, and probably there are already existing pattern languages around regenerative agriculture, um, but to the extent that they're not, or that there are gaps, you know, kind of plug into existing efforts and pattern sets, meta tools and resources and so forth. I think that's, that's also all in the wheelhouse of OGM, um, but, but uh, Klaus, I guess you're, you're pretty involved in that stuff and would know exactly what I mean there. Um, so I hope that was additive. And I think that's enough from my side, thanks. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, responding to, to your uh, question there, Jerry. <clears throat> but but my, my, my perception is that um, the most fertile grounds to, to approach right now you know, are these uh, disengaged voters you know, who, who are hanging on Trump and who are hanging on um, uh, someone's promise to help them and, and deal with their situation. And that's clearly not going to happen. Um, I mean, they're clearly being deceived, they're being used and so on. But, but they're in a, in a mental state that is just very fragile and, and very, um, very vulnerable. Here, and it, here is a, a point of engagement that makes so much sense from so many levels. They live in food deserts. You know, they don't know how to support themselves. There is, there is really, uh, they, they may, many of them don't even have internet access. You know, so there, there is, there's a long distance here. Um, at the same time, um, there are funding mechanisms out there. I mean, there are, there are, uh, there are trust funds and, and people with money who want to intervene. They want to see an intervention there. Um, but uh, they're dealing with individual entities who, um, who may have like one channel uh, that they're focused on. So to, to approach this uh, from an umbrella perspective, you know, saying that, and looking at, uh, as we mentioned before, from a community perspective, you know, what is unique in this community? What do they already have in resources? What resources could we bring to them? and have some funding where you may be able to send someone out there uh, to, uh, to engage with the community and start uh, connecting uh, the dots and developing um, a, with a, a system of relationships you know, with organizations that are already out there but do not have the resources to, to uh, uh, go out and, and propagate themselves. I think that, that sort of seems to make sense. You know? um, and I think that's completely within our reach. So it, it, it would require for us to have a mission statement uh, that is sufficiently detailed to go to a funding source, you know, and say, look, here is the uh, range of talents that we do have. Um, here, here is uh, a, a plan on, on how we see ourselves engage. Um, we need some funding for this. We have volunteers uh, as part of the program. We have some people who need to make a living as part of the program. Um, I, I think that could, that could gain traction. 
Klaus, who is the we that you're talking about? When you say we, who is the OGM. we that you're talking about? OGM, you know, and I mean, I but so you're, but again, I'm, I, I want to just play this tension here. You're referring to OGM as a group of people that are committed to the quest that you're on. And you're in, right. And, and you're saying, look, we're getting funding, we're getting resources, we're going after food. I think that that's great that there, that OGM can be a source of that stuff. I, I'm, I find it problematic though, that we're not equally going after education, the financial system, the health system, all of these other systems. And that OGM is a platform for people that are working in all of those human systems to transform them simultaneously. And so yeah. I think the, the we of OGM is not the not those people who are in the quest, but are those people that are enabling whatever the noble quests are to happen in a way that is most effective. Um, yeah, don't, that's don't, the piece that I'm pushing on. Yeah, yeah. Don't misunderstand me here. I'm not. Uh, I'm not singularly focused on food. You know, I'm. 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 I'm focused on the system that enables soil restoration, right? And that system involves right. uh, a whole lot of things. I mean, Kevin, for example, could be a a high valuable uh, component of this service that we uh, stitch together because you need local financing. And he's, he, he has developed something that's very narrowly focused right now, but that could be blown up uh, in, into a whole lot more ideas. Education you know, is a vital component of uh, turning rural communities towards uh, an, a more enlightened future. So, so I, I see this as a systemic intervention. So, so Klaus, I wanna go back to the question I asked you though. Um, because I, I was basically riffing on a whole variety of ways of possibly changing minds and hearts to, to shift their intentions. Um, you've just described a particular plan that could work in a particular set of parties to activate, which, I, which makes sense to me because the question I typed in the chat that I, I'm going to put in now is like, what experiment could we run to test your hypothesis about disengaged voters uh, being a great vector for a shift to regenerative agriculture? And correct me if I've misstated your, your thesis. But I'm also interested in, um, because, because when you step in, you step in with a plan. I'm trying to figure out how permeable are you to alternate solutions to, to experimenting your way toward your results, but, but with other people's notions of what, you know, hey Klaus, if I went and created four videos that, and, that were memes, would you help us propagate those memes? Even though propagating meme videos is not on your agenda right now, does that work for you? And then Neil is, is sort of talking about the, the meta status of the system and how that works. How does what Neil and I added, tried to add to your quest make you comfortable or uncomfortable? How permeable are you to other sort of uh, approaches to trying to solve, I think, your same intentions, your same goals? Yeah, I'm slow, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty slow. The, the, the I mean, Neil said, Neil said that he's, he's been having this wrestle with you for eight years, right? And yeah. I'm trying, to I'm trying to figure out how to, how to achieve your ends while opening up a much broader spectrum of experimentation, one of which is exactly the plan you just pre presented, but there might be a dozen. And, and, and Matt, and I would love to have a dozen experiments going in education, in local finance, in whatever, where where the one experiment we think is like awesome that we're trying to fulfill is, is the person who is leading the quest inside of OGM, whatever even inside of means. So Klaus, you would be like our point person uh, for, for heading after reforming the food system and shifting to regenerative agriculture. And we have a lot of pull across OGM members for that thing. I would love to participate. But I'm trying to figure out how do we create a broader sort of front of experimentation toward that goal while still fueling the initiative you have in mind. But, but you keep coming back to the initiative you have in mind and I'm trying to, I'm trying to open that. So, so yeah, maybe I'm not doing such a great job. In, can, in, can I in, offer yes. super quick? And Matt's gotta leave the call in a second. Super quick, because Klaus, I heard you doing a great job in one way, which, which um, was kind of just in passing, which is you were responding 
to Matt re relate re regarding the human, the various other human systems that need to be transform transformed simultaneously, right? Yeah. Um, and then you were kind of literally seeing through your lens and you were responding, pointing to Kevin and his local financing model that could be blown up, education as a vital component and so forth. Um, I think that that lens and that um, almost like list, laundry list, um, addressing the other human systems as a, as a way to translate and to invite in. I just wanted to flash on that because, yeah. go, go ahead, please. I, 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 I explained some, some time back my professional background working for Disney embedded within the Imagineering team, right? So anything that Disney touches involves food in some form or shape, right? I mean, it may be a cotton candy, or it may be a, a club 33 five-star five restaurant. And that's the same thing here. You know, everything we touch involves food in some form or shape because it's the, the, the foundational need. Um, but I'm, I'm totally aware that, you know, I, I don't know what Kevin is doing. I mean, I know what Kevin is doing, but I couldn't be doing it. So I see myself more embedded within, uh, you know, a system that needs to reform itself, and part of the a critical part of that reformation is the food system. Does that does that make more sense? So I, I'm I don't see myself dominating uh, or or guiding or, or leading. I see myself embedded within. The mm -hmm. Can we can we pause this? Can we jump to Judy and then go to Pete? Because Judy, I know you've been very patient trying to yes. jump in here, and I know Pete wants to wrap it, and I do want to get off at eleven fifteen. Yeah, I understand. We're all under time constraints. I just think we need to segregate zones of the conversation and commit to discussing a zone carefully because we're talking about what is OGM, which is a noun, but it's also a verb and it's an ethos and it's a cultural modifier and how you would do those different roles, fulfill those roles are different because of the means and mechanisms of doing that. And that's part of what I see creating the richness that will allow Klaus to choose those pieces that help his motion most effectively and engage people in movement, which is what we want to do for everybody. But we have to have the complexity of the whole in a systematic way that allows it to work equally well for the modification of a healthcare system or the modification of K-12 education or a changing of the mechanism of higher learning to truly learning and peer learning and all of those sorts of things. And I get excited about that really big picture, but then I also wanna drive down vertically and make sure it works in as many different models as we could hold simultaneously or be a resource to simultaneously. So that's just a framing construct. <laughs> um, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Judy. Pete, do you wanna jump in and um, take us I'd, home? I'd love to. Um, so uh, in, in my tribes, um, I'm a software developer, agile software developer. So we have a, a ceremony, tradition, traditional ceremony um, that we do uh, every day usually, so regularly. Um, sometimes you do them every week. And I've seen this done in software development and other things too. So um, it's not like uh, bring something crazy to OGM. Um, I think it's just a good way to work. And I think you all probably know check-ins too. So I'm, I'm kind of you know explaining something obvious. Um, but anyway, uh, so you have a regular meeting. Part of it is important that it's regular. Uh, you go around the table and everybody checks in. Here's what I'm doing. Here's the help I need. Here's how I got stuck. Uh, I need you know you and you and you to have a one-on-one -on -one later. And you try to keep it super quick. It's called a stand-up because originally it was literally people standing around a table, not sitting down, so that they would be encouraged to get the heck out and go do work instead of having a meeting. So I've got, um, usually uh, most people do this verbally. I, I have a productive um, uh, variant of it, which is I'd rather see everybody typing into the same document. And, and when I get that going in a group, what happens is everybody's essentially done their check-in by the time you know the second person has started talking about it. So you can just say, my bullets, 
um, and also I need, you know, and keep going. So you can do it very quick. Uh, I'm just going to dump uh, a couple bullets in the chat. Uh, these are the kinds of things that I would kind of catch up everybody on. Um, I'm also doing something which I think is cool, which uh, is talking about action stuff. You know, these are actually quests that have goals and success or failure and things like that. Um, I'm not even going to read them because uh, because you all can read them. Um, there you go. Great wrap, Pete. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, this feels like a good place probably to end this call because everybody's got to get back to their their work. But that was really useful. Neil, you want to chime in? Just one quick observation. Pete, I love what you're doing, and that works for those people who are currently working on a project. But when it's co-design, emergent processes, that's a different mechanism. So I think this is a front end, but there's also where's the play space? Where's the, you know, and what are the tools for the play for the playground? Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Pete, your audio suddenly cut out. Uh, I have at least one playground uh, or two uh, the bullets that I didn't include because they're not. <laughs> but yes, cool. please, we need space, more spaces for those too. And I'm trying to figure out how my daily, I mean, anybody who's using Trello to do a personal Kanban or a team Kanban has these sorts of things kind of up and in front of them, All right? So, so how might my now page function as a uh, check-in uh, board as well, function as a, and, and when I'm not on a project, function as a broadcast of my interests and superpowers? Right, so that so that I can be be picked up by a team that says, "Hey, hey, that's great. We're looking for somebody who really knows how to run PageMaker." Anybody remember PageMaker? Um, Vince, Vincent, and I are all over that. Um, so we we would love to see more now things and project directories and things like that. I, I also kind of acknowledge that there's a human thing and a attention thing getting together regularly and kind of committing to each other. Here's the stuff that I did. Here's the stuff right. I'm going to do. Here are the problems I have. It's, right. it's, there's a synchronous um, person to person thing that, that needs to happen as well. Cool. I'm just um, going to offer that um, Metacogs as a, as a group, a kind of amorphous uh, collective is, is quite open to all this kind of stuff and it's relevant. And, the, and uh, so those Tuesday evening Europe time, um, sessions could be useful for this kind of, kind of discussion as well. Cool. I agree, Charles. I, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, it's open, open space. Sorry, I missed, I missed that point, Charles. Can you just repeat that? I'm not sure if I missed something. There's, there. a, there's a group called Metacogs you might be familiar with, but you'd be certainly um, welcome to, to check it out. And we, we meet nine, uh, nine o'clock on Tuesday evenings in Europe. And uh, there's, it's metacogs, C-A-U-G-S dot org. You can check out the stuff there. Thanks. Cool. Um, we're probably Central European time. I don't know. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Let's let's wrap today's call. But that was really super useful. I'll post the video as usual. Hey. Beautiful. Thanks, everyone. And this, this was thank awesome. you. Great. Have a great day. Bye bye.